I always have to do a little promotion, a little advertising, right? So on the one minute short that I used last week, I quoted um, our, pa- our former seniors pastor, Stan Beard. I still get emotional, man. So many of you knew Stan, he died about four and a half years ago. And Stan and I would always have these, you know, varying conversations about different things in the world and our lives. But every time I let out on a mission trip, Stan would make this comment to me. Let's not embarrass the mission. And the first time he said that to me, I was like, let's not embarrass the mission. What is he? He's like, I was like, oh, what he was saying is you can carry out the mission of God in a way that actually pushes people further away than brings them closer. So then we'd get back from a mission trip, and what would Stan do? He had a question for me. Did we embarrass the mission, Paul? And I was like, it was such a good reminder for me of making sure that when we go out on mission, we're not embarrassing what it is that God would have us be about. Now, I want to bring that much closer to us, though, because we are all on mission, every one of us whether watching online, whether sitting in the sanctuary, we're all on a mission, a God-given mission. And part of our actions and part of what God is calling us to is the way in which we engage with the world. And so when I talk about hospitality, I talk about a gracious and generous hospitality. I want us to be thinking of that in terms of the church. I want us to be thinking in terms of, term, in terms of that when it comes to our own individual lives. And I want to be think, us to be thinking about it as seeing and recognizing and understanding that each and every one of us is on mission. We're being sent out by God to extend his grace, his mercy, his hospitality to the world. So our text for this morning, we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. Peter writes this, The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind, so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. That, by the way, is what we're going to be focusing on this morning. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, then notice there's a speaking and there's a serving. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength that God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Peter writes to a church and says, The end is near. That was some 2,000 years ago, right? And we are still kind of waiting on God's timing because our timing is obviously different than God's timing. But Peter is preparing a congregation and teaching a congregation and encouraging a congregation to say, make sure you are living fully and faithfully for the living Lord in your words and in your deeds, in your speaking and in your serving, in your praying. Live faithfully. And a part of that living faithfully has to do with extending hospitality to one another. Now, in the context in which Peter's probably writing, the early church, the way in which the early church grew is there were itinerant missionaries and preachers who would go from place to place to place, and they would need a place to stay, and they would have a letter of a church introducing them, and then there'd be people in that community who would house them. But so that's probably more, you know, that's kind of the context of which Peter is writing this. But he's saying, look, we as followers of Jesus have got to make sure that we are practicing a gracious and generous hospitality. Here's my concern. Do you notice what he said? Practice hospitality without what? Oh, you all caught that. Okay, yeah. So I have this concern. I'm like, Lord, if I'm extending hospitality to somebody and I am grumbling, does that count? Now, I'm not a workspace righteousness person, and I know we are all saved by grace, but I'm just wondering in God's ledger, 
Like if I'm like, oh, so glad you're here and so good to see you and so yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you gotta be kidding me. I have to host them, you know, does that count? I'll let you all just think about that the rest of the sermon because I'm not quite sure I figured this thing out. But there is this issue of offering a hospitality to others. And and when it comes to hospitality, the bottom line is this. We don't get to choose who we show hospitality to. Like, it's really easy to show hospitality to people who you like, people you get along with, people who think like you, act like you, behave like you, go to the same places you go to. Of course, that's a gracious and generous hospitality. And sometimes, you know, we also do, we we have a a hospitality that's based on, well, if I do this for them, then maybe they'll do something for me. Imagine if God felt that when he gave us the Garden of Eden. God's like, look, all of this, but I've got some conditions on all of this. And I'm really hoping that if I give you all of this, you'll love me even more. We have to be careful with our generous and gracious hospitality and that we we don't have a choice in terms of who we offer it to. We are simply told to be gracious, to be generous, to practice hospitality. But there is this issue of grumbling, And there's a lot of grumbling. I think back to the liberation of Israel from their enslavement in Egypt. You all recall this story. God raises up a liberator in the person of Moses. Moses goes and has all these encounters with Pharaoh. God finally says, enough, I'm going to let my people go. They make their way out of Egypt where they have been enslaved for 400 years. Reminder. They get to the Red Sea, they part the Red Sea and everything is great and everything is wonderful and they cross over onto the Red Sea and Moses sings a song and Miriam sings a song and there's joy and there's delight. By the way, we're in Exodus 15 at this moment. Do you remember how Exodus 15 ends? You may not remember how it ends. And the people grumbled against Moses. Wow, how long did that take? because they are at the bitter waters of Mara, and they said, we cannot drink this water. And the grumbling began. Now, if you continue to read Exodus 15, Exodus 16, Exodus 17, which I'm not going to do, but I'll let you do that at your own leisure at a later point. Guess what the people continue to do? Exodus chapter 16, there's no food to eat, so what do the people do? They Grumble, you're with me. Okay, good. They're grumbling and they're like, and they say, you know what, Moses? We'd rather be back in Egypt eating those pots of stew. And I mean, that is just this a crazy line of like, we'd rather be enslaved and have that food to eat. And then God provides the manna and God provides the quail. So that's Exodus chapter 16. And in Exodus chapter 17, this trend continues. We have been really good at grumbling for a long, long, long time. The people grumble again because there's no water to drink and Moses has to hit the rock and then there's water to drink. But what is God, I mean, but what's happening in their lives? Like God is saying, I am taking you from a place of where you've been enslaved and I'm taking you to the promised land and this should be a time of joy and delight and trust and praise. And God's like, hey, if I can part the Red Sea, I can probably feed you and I can probably give you water to drink. And yet how do the people respond? With grumbling. God is saying, I wanna bring you to a place of grace a place of wonderful hospitality, a place where the land is flowing with milk and honey. And the people grumble. Some of us, I suspect in this room, are better than others at grumbling, right? Like, I kind of think it's a spiritual gift, maybe not in a good way, but in a kind of a bad way. Like, it's just kind of just, yeah, yeah, I heard a few people say preach, right? Um, like, it's like no one sees that, but, but here's the, there is a serious problem with grumbling. So I'm going to quote from C.S. Lewis, love C.S. Lewis, but he relates grumbling to hell. Okay, this is a little bit of a longer quote, so we're going to kind of work our way through it. But listen to what he wrote, and this is in The Great Divorce. 
Which, by the way, I have to say one more thing about technology. This is where, like, chat GPT is great, because I had this quote, and I wasn't, wherever I had picked it up, said it was from some other book, from a book, and I was like, I don't think it's from that book that C.S. Lewis wrote. And so what did I do? I copy and pasted this quote into chat GPT. I said, C.S. Lewis, which book is it from? And it came back, The Great Divorce. So see, AI is pretty helpful, okay? Just letting you all know. I know it's dangerous. I'm I just want you to know. Anyway, so this is from The Great Divorce. Lewis writes this. Hell, ooh, I almost got two syllables out of that. That was almost a Texas hell right there. Three is the three was always the aim in Texas, right? When I was in the South, you gotta get hell, you gotta get three syllables with hell. Hell begins with a grumbling mood. Always complaining, always blaming others, but you are still distinct from it. You may even criticize it in yourself and wish you could stop it. But there may come a day when you can no longer. Then there will be no you left to criticize the mood or to even enjoy it, but just the grumble itself going on and on forever like a machine. It is not a question of God sending us to hell. In each of us, there is something growing which will be hell, unless it is nipped in the bud. What Lewis is warning us about is saying, do you see how quickly a grumbling spirit takes us down the pathway to hell? A separation from the living Lord. Lewis has a couple of other great quotes around hell, and he says, look, no one is sent to hell. No one is taken to hell. We simply make it there of our own volition. We are very good at empowering ourselves to get to a place of hell. His other quote I like, and I know he's probably this probably comes from somebody else, but he says, hell's doors are locked from the inside. We're on the inside. We can open those doors. But what Lewis is warning us about is saying grumbling can take you to a very dark place. It can become that which consumes your soul, that which takes you further and further and further away from the God who gives you life and the God who gives you hope. Grumbling, he says, hell begins, he says, with a grumbling mood. And you're like, Paul, can you do something redemptive here, please? Like, have I brought you all low enough or you want me to go a little bit lower, right? But there's this sense, I think it's a warning, but then there's this antidote. And that's what I want to talk about this morning because I think, I know at least for me personally, like, like I need this reminder of saying how easy it is to get stuck in a rut and how easy it is to start grumbling and that grumbling leads to ranting and that ranting leads to whatever else. And all of a sudden you're just mired in a literal hell, even though you're here on earth. So I'm going to share three verses very quickly, very succinct verses that, that I believe help us to get our eyes off of the grumbling and the whining and the complaining because we're just like the people of Israel wandering through the wilderness that God has promised them this great and wonderful promise. Things aren't working out how they think things ought to work out. They grumble, they complain, they whine, and God continues to show up. So let me offer a couple of thoughts on this. Romans chapter 14, verse 8, which is kind of really where our focus needs to be. If we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. We must keep this forefront in our lives. I referred to this several months ago as saying that, that, that we live our lives before an audience of one. We often tend to think of the audience and the crowd and who it is that we ought to be pleasing and this and all these other sorts of things. And really when it comes to our lives with God, we live for an audience of one. Paul would write in Galatians saying, hey, I don't live to to please the people around me. I I live to please the God who saved me. 
And one of the ways I think in which we fight against the grumbling and the complaining and the, all the sort of stuff that, 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 that we can see in our world that, that's wrong or it's not treating us right or whatever is that we remember that we live before an audience of one. We must desire that God comes in and becomes the primary thing, the primary hope of our lives, that God's spirit must fill our hearts because we live for an audience of one. Anne Lamott puts it as, as Anne Lamott puts it in kind of her Anne Lamott kind of language. She says something like, and I shared this at some point last year, I think, um, God cannot clean your house when you're still in it. Like if I'm setting up my own house and God's like, hey, you, you need to move out of that house so I can clean it up. And then maybe I'll let you move back in, right? But God can't, like if we're still living for ourselves and we're still, you know, doing all these other sort of things and we've taken our focus off of the living God, We've misplaced our hope. So as Paul says, the Apostle Paul says, whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Sometimes, and this is the second verse, we have to look for the goodness of God. Because we hear a lot of other stuff that's not good and that's not great and causes us concern and all these other sorts of things. But we need to be a people who look for the goodness of God. Psalm 27, verses 13 and 14. I remain confident of this, David writes, I will see the goodness of the Lord. And notice what he says, in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart, and wait for the Lord. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Are we making time to look for the goodness of the Lord? When we look up at the night sky, when we walk along the beach, when we drive through the mountains, are you looking for the goodness of God? Or are you just racing to the next thing? You see, to look for the goodness of God, sometimes that means we have to slow down. We have to reorient our lives. We have to remember that we live ultimately for God. Where do we see the goodness of God emerging? Whether that's in relationships, whether that's in hospitality, whether that's in an act of grace, whether that's in the sunset or a sunrise. Are we looking for the goodness of God in the land of the living? In the final text, Galatians chapter 6. Paul's wrapping up his letter to the church in Galatia. This is verses 9 and 10. And this then is a challenge to us when it comes to hospitality. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong in the family of believers. Let us not become weary in doing good. Let us not be weary in living out a gracious and generous hospitality. Don't grow weary. You see, when we keep doing the next right thing that is in front of us, when we keep offering gracious acts of hospitality without grumbling, right? Something changes. In us. I don't know if you notice this or not, but I find, you know, I, the the transformation that happens for me, I mean, I, I love teaching and I love sitting under people's teaching and I love learning new things, but the transformation that happens is actually when I'm out serving, when I'm actually out doing something. And I think that's what Paul's describing here in Galatians. He says, do not grow weary in doing good for others. Because when we're doing good for others, when we're practicing a gracious and generous hospitality, we're helping other people, but we ourselves are being changed. We are becoming more and more like the image of Jesus Christ. Because when we give, it actually makes us want to live. 
in our giving, we find ourselves living even more fully and even more completely. So in order to combat the grumbling and the whining and the complaining, let us remember that we live for God. Let us look for the goodness of God. Let us do good for the sake of another. Wrapping up, Philippians chapter 2. Always love this image that the Apostle Paul gives to the church in Philippi. He says, Do everything without grumbling or argue, arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. And then this line, Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I, the Apostle Paul says, will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. Do everything, Paul says, without grumbling and arguing so that you may become blameless children of God in a warped and crooked generation. You see, if we as the church and if we as followers of Jesus are no different than the world, then have our lives really been transformed? If we grumble and complain and behave just like the rest of the world, has the gospel really taken root in our lives? And when we as followers of Jesus show up for church on Sunday morning bearing grudges against others, complaining about this or complaining and grumbling about that. Are we really any different? But the Apostle Paul says, do you know what has happened because of Jesus Christ? Do you know who you are in Jesus Christ? You are a new creation. The old has passed away, a new life has begun, and we can rattle off all sorts of scriptures about that. But we must recall that, that because of Jesus, everything is different. Because we have this hope-based, um, this hope-based life, everything is different. Everything changes because of the goodness and the grace of Jesus Christ. That's what allows us then to offer hospitality to one another. The Apostle Paul says, it'll shine like stars in the night sky. There's something, there, there's something, there's this glow about our lives. It's, it goes back, y'all remember in the book of Exodus, uh, oh, it's towards the very end, and thir- chapter 34, 35, somewhere in there. Um, when Moses would go up to speak with God, and then he would come back down the mountain, and his face was glowing so much, the people freaked out, right? They're like, look, he's got to cover his face. He's glowing too much. Like we, we, we could barely even stand to look at him. But there was something about that encounter with God that literally changed him physically. Like his face glowed. It shone like something that they had never seen before. And I think that that is what the Apostle Paul is trying to describe. He says, when your life has been changed and touched by Jesus Christ, there will be a glow about you there will be something different about you and people will notice it. And I want that to be us. I want that to be me. I want this goodness and this gift that God has given to me and to you through Jesus Christ to be evident in my life and to be evident in my words. And will I mess it up? Yes. And will I grumble and complain? Guaranteed by the end of today, that's probably going to happen. Maybe in the next 30 minutes, possibly. I think I kind of have a spiritual gift of grumbling, by the way, in case you haven't picked that up. But will I see a bigger picture? And that is the goodness and, G- and grace of Jesus Christ, the one who is my hope and my salvation, the one who wants my life to be radically transformed so that I can then offer a generous and gracious hospitality. I think it's always good as we wrap up here this morning, I think it's always good to do a grumble check, okay? Like kind of assess where you're at because that quote of C.S. Lewis scares me. That hell begins with grumbling. 
And it's a quick path sometimes, right? But I think, you know, part of what this sermon was about today is just saying, hey, we've got lots of reasons to be joyful. But the apostle Paul says, he's like, I am so happy about this church in Philippi because they're, they're glowing like the stars. He's like, my work has not been in vain. I have done what God asked me to do. They are filled with joy. And my friends, we can be a people filled with that same joy. The world is difficult. Yes, we'll admit that. But God says, I'm going to walk with you. You do not walk alone. Pray with me, please. God, we need a hospitality that's based on something bigger than us, a hospitality that extends from beyond us. It is easy to get caught up in this world and the things of this world, to grumble and complain, and to move quickly towards a place that we don't want to be. So, Lord, forgive us when we do that and set us free. Lord, help us to focus back again on Jesus. Help us to see the good things that you are doing in and around us and help us to serve others in joy, recognizing the gift that has been given to us in and through Jesus Christ. We pray and ask these things in his name. Amen.